Welcome everyone. I want to talk today about a topic that is very important to a lot of my subscribers and a lot of my private clients and I'm sure even more people than that. Um, hot topic for many of us about how to spot and avoid people who are emotionally unavailable, particularly, you know, if you're single and dating or soon to be single and dating. Um, yeah, I got to put that out there because we're dealing with that, right? We're dealing with that uh, dynamic as well. But um, what can you look out for? Okay, there's six main personas that I have outlined in my book, Healing from Narcissistic Abuse. Um, it's actually on Vimeo for those of you who are interested, and I will be releasing it later um, on, on other platforms. Um, if you want to know more about that, I'll talk about it at the end. But based on what I've already you know, outlined in that teaching series, um, I have identified six main personas. And very quickly, they are the bad listener, the controller, the perfectionist, the anger mismanager, the inconsiderate and evasive. And finally, the sixth, I will call the VIP, the very important person. Okay, so the bad listener is someone who might be very charming, very flirtatious. They seem to be really charismatic, a good talker, and you feel like, oh, it's just clicking. The conversation's firing off, but they're not really good at listening. You figure this out because you have to keep repeating yourself to them. And why? Because they weren't really listening to you the first time around. Be aware of that. This can also get really confusing because some people, they come across in their, their talking that they are open and they are vulnerable because they start sharing, you know, what they're going through emotionally. Like they could say, oh my gosh, I just came out of a really difficult relationship or I had a really hard time. And then they start sharing at a personal level and you think, well, this person's really emotionally open and up to me. But um, just be careful, be cautious with that, because sometimes this is a way that if they're a covert narcissist, a way that they can kind of bait you in to putting all the focus and care and attention onto them. And it gets really imbalanced from that point on. It appears like intimacy. It feels like intimacy, but it's really emotional manipulation. Um, it, it is a way of them bringing the conversation all on them. And unfortunately, if you're dealing with a covert narc, it will always be about them. <laughs> it will always be about them. Okay, so just be mindful of that. The controller. This is a person who doesn't want to be flexible about their schedule. They don't want to negotiate with people. They set the rules and the rules are firm. Like this is what I can do and this is what I can't do. They don't want to compromise. It's their way or the highway. It's very fixed. And you know, everything revolves around them and their schedule and their priority. And you're just supposed to kind of fall in line with that. So um, be aware of little hints that get dropped because early on you might think, you know, you're giving them the benefit of doubt, you're wanting to believe the best in them, but over time you start adding the pieces up and realizing that, no, you were not being judgmental, this was not a misunderstanding. Yeah, you wanted to give them a chance, but um, maybe you reasoned away red flags, okay, and you don't wanna do that. Again, this person can seem very charming, very vulnerable, and like they have a legitimate reason why their situation needs to be prioritized ahead of yours, uh, but just stay aware of the facts. Um, I'm not saying rush into making conclusions, but don't disregard your gut because, again, if they're always the priority, well, they might always be the priority, okay, and that might never change. Be aware of how these relationships get started and how they get set up with somebody making it very clear that they are the priority, their preferences, 
their schedule and whatnot is to take precedence in some way over yours. And also look at their past relationships. Um, as you're getting to know this person, how long have, do they typically last in a relationship? Um, I know a narcissist, for example, who usually is only able to maintain a relationship roughly around the two year mark. I mean, he's gone longer and he's gone shorter, but on average two year mark, why? Think about it. What happens around the two year mark? Well, definitely the honeymoon is over. I mean, a lot of people say that ends after the first six months, but definitely at the two year mark, this is where the rubber meets the road. And people generally are having conversations at this point, like, where are we going? Are we going to take this to the next level? Are we ready to deepen this commitment? But again, if this is somebody who keeps having, they can't make it past the two year mark or they're averaging the two year mark, really look at what is happening in the relationship, uh, this pattern. Uh, what are they, are they getting bored? Are they bailing out because it's getting too heavy, too committed, too many expectations? And then they just bail out of there. So pay attention to the patterns with these people who, yeah, they're controlling. They've got to maintain control. And if they feel that the expectations are getting out of their control, they're just going to bail out of there. So uh, the perfectionist is somebody who is looking uh, for somebody who's very perfect, the ideal partner. And this can be very deceptive because this can be someone who has this idea of, say, the ideal wife, <laughs> and that ideal wife doesn't actually exist in reality, and this is precisely the reason why um, they never find her. She doesn't exist, and it's all on purpose, okay? Now, this guy can come across very harmless. Um, he can come across like he's well-meaning. He's a man of commitment. He wants to settle down. He wants to have a family. Um, he might even state that this is his goal, all right, to, you know, live this traditional life, okay? But then he's got some story about how he's saving his heart for the one. And it sounds really noble, right? Wrong. <laughs> Way wrong, okay? Um, this is a fantasy wife that he's imagined for himself, and he's holding out for this person, like a hopeless romantic. But she never comes along because she doesn't exist. And that's by design, okay? Because truthfully, truthfully, this is his way of avoiding intimacy. And you will see that this man leaves a trail of broken hearts behind him. And yeah, definitely whenever these women have gotten involved and then finally he breaks the inevitable predictable news oh sorry uh, you're just not the one I can't really love you or commit to you because you're just not the one then you know there's a fallout right and I don't mean to badmouth the men because this can go both ways I've you know come across a couple uh, several actually uh, women who are emotionally unavailable. So this can go either way. Please don't get offended if you're a man watching. I'm not man hating. <laughs> Believe me, I've got three kids, three daughters. Much love for, you know, masculine energy, right? Um, but yeah, this is if, if you're dealing with a perfectionist, um, here's the problem. If they can't find the flaw in you to disqualify you from, you know, a commitment and love, then they're going to start questioning that. They're going to be really concerned, like, well, why is this woman perfect? You know, what's, what's really going on? This woman is too good to be true. I don't know if I can trust this. And so the real thing that's going on is that you know, at the root of all of this is a desire to avoid intimacy. Some of these people may not be self-aware. They don't know that this is why they keep going through this looping pattern is because really deep down they're afraid of opening their hearts up or getting into a committed relationship. And that's why they keep finding fault with everybody. That's why they keep setting standards that nobody can live up to. Um, it's a setup. And you know, as long as you're involved with this person, you're always going to be disqualified from having intimacy with this person. 
And it's not about perfection. It's really about avoiding the intimacy. That's what's at the root of it. And that's why no one's ever good enough. And I'm telling you, if you get involved with somebody like this, you will never be qualified. You will never be good enough in their eyes. Stay away. Stay away. Now, the anger mismanager is somebody who um, has arrogance. Okay, pay attention to arrogance issues, road ragers, people that... Um, mistreat other people who they perceive are in some kind of lesser status than they are, maybe people in service type positions like wait staff, you know, um, people who do, I don't know, janitorial work or people who pick up the trash or, you know, whatever, all right? I once went out on a date with a guy who was bragging about this kind of behavior and in my opinion, it was very low character behavior. And when I kind of low key pointed that out to him, he really joked it off and made light of it. So be aware of this because that's kind of a something that narcissists do, which is a gaslighting technique. I talk about it in my book where they make you question and doubt yourself. They'll say things like, you're too serious. Um, you need to lighten up. Um, that's not what I meant, or it's just a joke. Why are you taking things so, you know, and then they insinuate that the problem is really with you, um, not them. And so, yeah, just be aware that, again, if you get into dynamics with people where they're using gaslighting techniques, which, you know, you know you're being manipulated by somebody who maybe as a narcissist, and yeah, the anger mismanager is a dead giveaway, perhaps a covert narcissist, um, overt narcissist. <laughs> okay, number five, the inconsiderate and uh, evasive. Um, be aware of people who do not take other people's time into consideration, and they're evasive about it. Like, you can't seem to get a straight commitment about meeting up with them at a certain time or place or... Um, they say things that you just like you ask a straight question, but you don't get a straight answer or they answer in a way that has a dual meaning. And then when you try to really nail them down to, you know, asking them, what did you mean by that when you said that, uh, then they're very, they're still unwilling to reveal their true feelings, intentions and motives. They might even deny those true feelings, intentions and motives. So when you see this kind of thing happening in conversations, what's happening is they're avoiding a depth of intimacy and accountability. So ironically, at the same time, they could be very invasive towards you. Like you ask them questions, they're evasive, but then they're invasive and in asking you questions, you know, like about your monetary situation or your sex life, your sexual preferences and desires, and so on. Things that are very private, they could just get right in there. This is because perhaps there's some kind of manipulation going on where they're trying to move things at a faster pace than you know what is in proper order. Why? Because they don't want to take the time, the proper level of effort and work to build trust in this relationship. And yeah, this could be somebody who's very, very seductive. They go basically to third base without first passing through first or second base, so to speak, because they don't want to put the work in. And maybe they're afraid of putting the work in or, you know, maybe they're afraid that if they slow down and, you know, really give you the time to get to know them, that you're going to find out something about them where you decide that you don't want to be sexually involved with this person. And yeah, for some of them, they just flat don't want to be known at a deeper level. Um, they are more into conquering somebody than really being known, to know and be known by another person. For them, it's more about power and conquering the other person, more about the chase. If you see this kind of stuff where somebody's like really going fast and they're skipping steps, they're not putting the work in, the effort, um, just you know, don't overlook these things. Don't make light of it. And yeah, it's easy to make light of it because you can be like, wow, this person is really into me. Wow, we have this amazing chemistry. Isn't this great? You know, I haven't had this attention in, 
you know, whatever, how long, okay? But um, reality is you, you need to acknowledge that this person, for whatever reason, they are not taking their time to build trust, which is necessary for a relationship to endure over the long term. And yeah, if you ignore that, then in the long run, you know, you, there's going to be pain, right? That really, frankly, could be avoidable if you just pay attention to that, that red, those red flags. Finally, the VIP, the very important person. Uh, this is the sixth persona of an emotionally unavailable person. Um, they're going to make you feel like you have to earn their attention. Uh, when you're talking to them, it might feel like they're really not looking into your eyes. They're not really listening to you. They're not really seeing you or hearing you or feeling you. They're not even asking questions about you. They're not inquiring and trying to get to know you. They might actually, they might a ask n nothing or very little about you, which is a big red flag. Again, why do you not care about who you're getting sexually involved with here? You know, for example, they might know that you have kids, but they don't ask about them. Be careful about that. That's kind of a sign, um, you know, that they don't want to get it. They, they might want to have a relationship with you, but they don't want to have a relationship with you and your kids. Um, or they just flat want a sexual relationship. They don't really want anything more than sex with you. So be aware because some people also conversely could be asking about your kids, but they're doing it more on a superficial level. And if you're looking, you know, into the depth of it, beyond the surface of things, um, ask yourself, are they really trying to get to know you? Are they just going through the motions because this is what sounds good or looks good? It looks like they care and they're interested, but they really don't care. Like, are they genuinely listening to you when you answer them? Um, or can you tell that they're just waiting for you to stop talking so they can get the conversation back on them? Also, are they sharing and mirroring the information back to you, conveying that they understand what you've heard, uh, that what they've heard you say like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I heard you said, um, you know, your son is a soul. You know, I've got a, a son that old, too, or, you know, something to that effect. OK, in these conversations, how much risk of vulnerability and authenticity is being expressed? As you're being vulnerable and authentic, are they doing the same? When you ask them questions, are they mirroring back the same level of transparency and depth as you've been giving them? Or are they keeping things shallow? You're being deep and they're being shallow. So um, also, are they dodging questions and changing the subject? Okay, so. What's really key here is paying attention and balances with the, all six of these personas that I outlined. Um, the bad listener, the controller, the perfectionist, the anger mismanager, the um, inconsiderate and evasive, and finally the, the VIP, all six of those personas. Pay attention to imbalances going on, not just um, emotionally, but also verbally. Like, is there monopolization of conversation? Is somebody doing all the talking? Um, and, you know, if you do kind of call them out on something, are they being defensive, reactive, or are they being responsive? Um, does this person leave you unsure of where you stand with them? Because they're unclear, you know? Um, and if so, what are you doing to clarify this? And if you are trying to clarify this, again, are they being defensive or reactive? Because somebody who's being purposefully, um, not being purposefully vague, they're not going to be annoyed by your effort to understand them better, okay? They're going to be honored by it, and they're going to try to match your effort. And that's what we really want to be looking for is you know, avoiding the imbalances and going after matched effort, reciprocal effort. Finally, you know, other imbalances that you might want to consider is, are they not including you in, you know, when meeting family and friends? Are they not introducing you to family and friends? Um, are they trying to keep the relationship a secret? Um, do you at times wonder are, if you're being used, you know? Um, 
again, do your conversations always stay very surfacey and never really get to a depth of understanding and exchange where you're able to really know what their true intentions and motives are? Are they putting limitations on your ability to communicate so that it's only through like text, email, social media, but never face to face or very limited face to face? And if so, that might be again back to this control tactic where they're controlling the dialogue, they're controlling the exchange, and it's a way of not allowing the relationship to get too personal. You know, this can be heartbreaking. I'm going to say, if you know, I think many of us have gone through these kind of dynamics and we're like, why is this person treating me this way? And yeah, it can definitely make you feel, you know, definitely like confused, insecure, lonely, like you're not valued, you're not being prioritized. And it might be because, um, you know, they got one foot in the door and one foot out the door in a relationship. Either they're still with the ex and they're trying to figure out how to leave or um, they, uh, they've they left the ex, but they still haven't gotten over the ex. Or you could just straight up be dealing with somebody who's very um, emotionally unhealthy, okay? Uh, they could be a narcissist, they could be a sociopath, just steer clear of whatever the reason is, they're not ready and you can't really make these people ready. Unfortunately, if you try to like cater to the imbalance, um, you know, you, you try to prioritize them for a time, unfortunately what happens, it stunts their realization that, hey, I, I need to make changes in my life, okay? You don't want to make it too comfortable for people to you know, breadcrumb you uh, because they are divided within themselves and they really need to make a decision to get whole again and get healthy. So, um, yeah, if, if, if you're dealing with somebody who's non-committal or just you can't seem to grow the relationship, can't ever seem to get it to the next level, no matter how much effort you put into it, this could be why you could be dealing with somebody who's emotionally unavailable. So I hope that I've said something here that's helped you. And if you want to know more about, you know, why you might be attracting emotionally unavailable people and what you can do to shift that, to really change and heal that um, within yourself, then uh, you might want to check out my Healing from Narcissistic Abuse series on Vimeo um, and the videos are like $3.99 each, very accessible, very affordable, and um, very soon I will also be releasing uh, this on, e on Kindle. It will be ebook, and shortly thereafter it will be on Amazon in print and then on Audible. So um, if, you, if you're watching this, you know, at a time when I've already published all of that, I'm going to have the links below, but for the time being, I will put what is currently available, which is on Vimeo. Links will be down below if you're interested in that. Definitely um, the fifth part of the series is where you can learn more about avoiding emotionally unavailable people. And if you're interested, I hope you'll join me for that. Till next time, be blessed.